channel. Yesterday I got my Baker Creek seed catalog in the mail as well as the seed order that we're going to be using for 2020 and I wanted to uh, open that up and share that with you guys as I opened it. I actually started cutting it open and then I was like oh I should make a video and show everybody else this the seeds that I ordered so you guys can see um, kind of the plan and what we plan on growing I did get seeds from from Baker Creek they're an heirloom seed company so you have two different types of seeds you have what's called an heirloom and a hybrid so a hybrid has been uh, modified it hasn't been run generation over generation it's been changed so you're not guaranteed that you're going to get that off of the next fruit set if you collect the seeds and use them the next year if it is not an heirloom seed, then you may not get a true to type fruit the, the following year. Okay, with that said, um, let's go ahead and open this up. I wanted to open this up yesterday, but it was sunny and we had a hole to dig for the septic system. So we had to put this off because we had to get, you know how it is. If you live in an area where it rains quite a bit, you have to work outside while you can. So that's what we did yesterday. Today it's rainy. So we're doing the inside stuff. And lucky for you, we get to open up seeds. I'm happy to see what's inside. Let's do it. So this is the Baker Creek Heirloom Seed uh, Catalog for 2020. They do change up their uh, their varieties and what they, what they have. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out here and that uh, one of the reasons that we chose to to get the majority of our seeds from Baker Creek is because they do these seed trials so they test it says about a thousand varieties a year and um, they do this in Missouri and Missouri has a very similar climate to us in Kentucky when we lived in Arizona before um, we used a lot of seeds from a company called Seeds of Change. We had very good success with those. Um, but we decided uh, this year and to start off to go with Baker Creek. And um, this, this was a major factor. I also did some research as far as how many seeds per packet that you get for your dollar. And... Um, the value was there. It was a good value for the money. Um, there is an expo going on that they have going on in September this year in California. We don't have any plans to go to that. I do believe there is also an event and uh, it is at the actual location in Missouri. And uh, that location I googled that is about three hours away from us. So We'll look that up and we may be going to that. Um, they also do offer, and I, I looked these up, they didn't have the figs in stock, but I want to get some figs from them. I really like figs. The kids enjoyed figs. We had figs in Arizona. I, I really want to get some of these. I looked for them online, but they did not have um, any in stock. They also did not have any of the uh, strawberries in stock at the time. But they have a few live plants. They don't, they don't have very many. This is the extent of them right there. Um, so then the catalog as well as the website goes into an alphabetical listing. You can search by particular thing. Like if you're looking for cabbage, you, it has a, the website has an online search. So this goes through and shows, you know, A, B. Now we're in the beans. I'm not going to go through the whole catalog. This is a, a beet that we, we chose to go with. Um, an Italian variety. One um, thing, a tip that I got from a guy named Paul from Back to Eden. He's up in Washington. But he said if you ever find anything that states it is an Italian heirloom, use that. Those are usually very good and they've been grown for, for a lot of times thousands of years. It's not just stuff that, that has come across and, and been only grown here for maybe you know 10 years or 20 or 30 years or even hundreds of years but these varieties have been grown for thousands of years so a lot of the varieties that I chose 
are Italian heirlooms um, whenever I could get those. So this is, a, this is a neat little catalog. I believe the catalog is free. Or maybe they sent it because I ordered the seeds. I did um, order this about two weeks before I ordered this. And, and this came in at the exact same time. So I haven't opened the packet yet. And that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, like I said before, I started opening the packet and I figured I might as well make an unboxing. So here we go. I haven't seen anything that's in here. Um, so we'll just kind of open this. I'm going to be looking for the... Um, I'm going to be looking for the invoice and see... Um, I spent $211 on seats. See if I can find that mention of the catalog. So I don't see the catalog in here anywhere. Using my speed scan skills. I believe the catalog is free. If you go online, I know that if you enter your email address, you can get on their, their newsletter and you'll get little updates about events and um, maybe new product varieties that they, they're going to start and uh, they will send you a catalog for free. Okay, so let's go into the seat. Um, they also did um, send me, when I was online looking at the checkout, they also sent me a bunch of these free varieties. I don't know how many you have to order, but when we go through here, I noticed, like I said, when I was in the checkout, there was these free seed packets. So it looks like I got four of those. So I'm curious to see what those are because I don't know. So, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's kind of organize these a little bit. I'm already starting to see some lettuces in here and some chard. So here's, here's a group of lettuces that we're gonna go with. There is also a, uh, there's a walking stick kale that gets very large and uh, it's pretty neat um, let me see I think I actually saw that no it wasn't in the back but um I saw a picture of that the walking stick kale and it just keeps on growing it's a really neat variety because you can keep pulling from it and the stock just keeps going up and up. I did order these two sunflower seeds that we'll come across later. I um, What I used to do in Arizona was I used to go to Sprouts, which was like a natural food store, and I used to get raw sunflower. It can't be roasted or salted, but then I would just plant that, and I had really good success. But I can't wait to see how these come out. I mean, these things are beasts. If, if the sunflowers get half the size that these are, I'll be super happy with that. I mean, look how large those things are. It's just amazing. So I got this two varieties. Um, we're look, we're talking about that uh, that kale. I'm not sure if I ordered it. If I did not order it, I will order it. So let's just go through the seeds. So here's uh, here's some lettuces that I that I ordered. This is a romaine type of lettuce. Well, let's just say I plan on thinking about doing our aquaponics. And I had very good success with these two lettuces in aquaponics. And they're a very long lasting lettuce. So if we take lettuce to market, these are um, lettuces that I think will do very well. I've never grown a uh, Swiss chard, but um, I decided to uh, to go with that it says there it's a perpetual spinach so it's a spinach type um, then cabbage collards um, I also know that I have some mustard greens in here I like to actually buy the um, the canned mustard greens for some reason it when I eat those it makes me feel good and they taste good so there's those beets I was telling you about these are an Italian heirloom as well pre 1840 Italian heirloom and they're pretty neat looking inside Beets are very good for a circulation, especially the, the greens, well, the, the whole plant. A lot of the circulatory boosting medicines that you get 
will actually have beet powder in them and stuff like Viagra and those things those things are actually circulatory benefactors and, and a lot of that actually comes from the same chemical compounds that are in beets so beets will make you feel good all right get you some beets there's uh there's some carrots I think actually that is the only two variety of carrots that I there's those those mustard greens that I was telling you about and that's a southern giant the south is really known for its mustard greens so there's I believe ends out the greens oh there's the kale that, that other one was called a cabbage Um, I don't remember ordering this cabbage, so maybe this is, is one of the free ones. Oh, this is, here it is right here. Okay, this answers the question right here. Free gift, FR101. Thank you for your order. So that explains it. So whenever I got a free one, it has the, um, that little sticker on there. Cool. Thanks for the free gift, Baker Creek. Um, Goji berry. So I did order quite a bit of, of fruits. This is actually a uh, like a bush that has these little goji berries. I looked for some of these at the uh, Whole Foods store when I was up in Louisville last time. And these little dudes were going for almost $10 a pound. Like $9.90 something a pound. They're dried. But they're really good. They're supposed to be full of antioxidants. Um, they're very small. I mean when they're dried out they're they're little guys But they're they're tasty. They have a a very distinct taste. They almost have a hint of of like a hot pepper So um, this is going to be a good addition and these are perennial So a lot of these that you're seeing, you know, like like the the greens those are going to be a uh, an annual Those are things that you're going to have to regrow and start every spring But we're going to try and do as many perennials as we can that way um, those things are around and they just keep producing um, one time plant that's I did order a lot of strawberries the kids like strawberries I like strawberries um, I think I ordered probably five overpacked due to low germination okay so the note here is that they gave me um, more than it normally would have in it because they found with their seed trials that they were not germinating at the same rate that they expected them to so they overpacked it they they put more in there that's what that note is for there's uh just a little note on strawberries usually you have um what they call ever bearing or summer bearing so some strawberries you'll just get a huge production um, for a couple of months and then they'll kind of just chug along and go dormant but the ever bearings um, those will produce a little bit at a time usually it will say on there whether it's an ever bearing or a like a June bearing is what they call it I don't see it on here this variety uh, Tresca is says it's from Poland um, and that you can harvest the first year good for containers. This is actually a very um, Well-known variety the red wonder Wild and I'm hoping these take off and these become perennials where they will get um, Established and then they'll just keep sending out runners and they'll just keep going if you get a good strawberry patch um, we had one in Tucson at our first house and I never could get that variety again um, I should have taken a couple of, of the runners and uh, planted them out. But I believe, I'm pretty sure it was this variety. So hopefully those will, those will work out. Let's see if we can find some more strawberries in here. There's some tomatoes. Here's those um, sunflowers that I mentioned before. So we got those. And then there is a whole um, herbs that I got. There's another sunflower. This sunflower I got mainly for cut flowers. It's not really a seed producing flower, but um, I actually planted some flowers. I planted some nasturtiums last year in, in the garden. 
and it really did have a, a different feel the garden did it wasn't just a green garden with with vegetables and such so I think I'm going to incorporate a lot more flowers this year and this is one of them I did mean to order nasturtiums again um, but this flower the the sole purpose of it is just for its aesthetics just for its looks and um, we'll see if it can uh, bring in a little income for for a cut flower let's see let me just kind of um, so here's another fruit and it has some instructions on here here's a it's a banana that says it can be grown in this area um, this species relatively hardy taking a few degrees of frost fairly well um, we may have to do this in a greenhouse we do have plans to get a greenhouse set up fairly soon but that I thought was pretty neat. These, these were a little pricey as far as seeds go. I want to say this was like uh, five or six dollars. Yeah, right there, pink banana, six dollars. But if, if we can get some bananas to go, that would be pretty cool. So hopefully, we'll see. We'll keep you updated. Still looking for some strawberries and sorting a little bit. Okay, so we took a little break and organized the pile. It was um, not very efficient that way. So we kind of broke it down into vegetables. There's some fruits, perennials in here, flowers, herbs, and then cover crops. So we'll kind of go over these and did find two more packets. There was one more of the Red Wonder, and then I also found this Attila Strawberry. So you can tell we really like strawberries. One thing that I, is to plant things that you like. Don't plant stuff just because it grows well in your area or whatever it may be. Um, zucchini did really well in, in Arizona. But um, you can only eat so much zucchini. Plant what you like. Um, here's a pawpaw. In this area, um, pawpaw doesn't grow everywhere. So this is almost like a lot of people, I've never actually tried one. I found it in the wild. I was actually up in um, Greensboro, North Carolina on a hiking trail around a reservoir there. And I found it, but it was too green to eat. So um, we're, this is one thing I'm really looking forward to. It's supposed to taste kind of like mango. Some people uh, call it banana custard fruit. Hopefully we can, we can get these to go. It's just a little note. Um, I'll bring this strawberry back over. All of these have a particular type of germination that you have to know. You can't just, um, some of them you can, but a lot of them you can't just place them in the ground. You can't just go find you a little spot, poke a hole, put the seed in the ground. They have different depths. They have different um, times of the year. Um, some of them you're going to want to start in a paper towel and a Ziploc bag set up. And we'll show you these, these different methods. But you have to do your research and find out um, the right way to germinate to get that seed going. What's going to activate it. Um, here's some root crops. Um, this is a, um, immediately when I saw this one I knew that I didn't order it. And sure enough, that was one of the free seeds. So there's a radish. I actually didn't order any radishes. So I'm kind of glad that they sent this because um, my history with the radish is that I plant them, they pop up quick. I mean, radishes, if you're planting a survival food, I believe radish is usually number one um, because it comes up so quick. I think it's usually like 20 to 30 days before you have an edible product. And they're super hardy. They're just a little go-to plant. But I've never liked the way they taste. So I don't plant them. I don't order them. Um, but I'm glad I got those radishes and I'll give them a try. So here's two types of carrots. I've actually planted both of these. The Danvers uh, Half Long is a very common carrot. This one says it um, goes back to the 19th century. This is a, a French variety. I'm not sure how you would say that in French. Nantes is... Um, how I would pronounce it, but I've actually grown these before and I've had really good luck though The, the uh, brand I used before 
was the seeds of change but I'm sure these will be good um here's another root crop some onion we started some green onion from just store-bought green onion um they were organic but um you've got to have some onion i did find some more of the um greens this is a free seed here this i actually saw this and i thought that looks like a neat lettuce but sometimes you can get carried away especially this first year where our main priority is to grow food for ourselves not a whole lot of market um i thought i better keep it fairly simple and not get too carried away with variety this is one that i considered i didn't order but they sent it to me so this is pretty neat another little note just for us here is a lot of these seeds you know they, these will come with um, 30 40 50 seeds in them a lot of times especially these lettuces but you have to remember that every one of those is a plant so we'll probably only use and i was telling uh, my wife and kids this um, last week we'll probably only use about 10 to 20 percent of these seeds this year because we don't have a real well established garden area so we'll end up saving a lot of these one thing that we really want to do and i'll skip over to the um, the cover crops and the grains Another thing I'll kind of point out is Baker Creek kind of has a code. They have a, like this one starts with a GS. So that's the grains and, and cover crops. So this probably has, this oat probably has a GS as well. Yeah, see it has GS for grains. So one of the things that we want to do is get um, some grains going as well. Not just fruits and vegetables, but some grains not only for ourselves for the the livestock this also adds a uh, protein and um, basically higher nutrient value than just grass um peas is a very common cover crop it says right on there grains and cover crops and this is a winter pea this is something we can actually plant right now and we won't have to wait till that last frost we can get this going so this is something that we're going to focus on. I got some peanuts. That should be good. Here's also some other variety of peas. This is, says it's a perennial pea, which is pretty neat because that means that these vines should last at least a couple years and go through the winter. Like I stated before, there's different um, germination instructions. So here this one says soak overnight before planting direct sow in early spring into rich well worked soil thrives in moderate conditions of spring so you need to know what each seed needs to do its best and then it has some other instructions here sprouts in 14 to 21 days ideal temperature 55 to 65 degrees and that's the ambient temperature the outside temperature seed depth quarter to half inch spacing six inches apart frost hardy yes so this usually means now if, if it's a young seedling you you can't necessarily count on that if it's an established plant and it says frost hardy it will probably do okay if it gets under freezing under 32 degrees for a little while minimum full sun six to 12 hours so there's um, instructions that all of these will actually have on them and then you can do more research. Um, what I'll do a lot of times if I haven't grown something is I'll actually look up on YouTube some tips. You know, the more information that you have and you can give yourself, the better results that you're going to get. So here's two varieties. Um, these sugar snaps are pretty neat because you can pick them at different stages. A lot of times they won't even be developed and you can just eat the pot and all. Um, says right here delicious tender pods are great raw stir fried or frozen yeah we've used these before and had very good luck with these these are one of the items you can just pluck right in the garden and uh, eat they're really tasty and good for you all right so let's move on um, we'll kind of stay in the uh, cover crops and grains here's some oats like i said to add uh, nutritional value to to the plants we plan on getting um, we're leaning towards sheep. We need some type of a grazer, a, a grass ruminant stock to keep the grass down 
and this is a great option for grazers we also have winter rye this can be used in breads you know a lot of these like the oats and then you'll see in here i also have uh, different wheat varieties that we can use ourselves for bread but it just it's a productive plant a lot of what we want to do is have things on our homestead that's productive right now i would say probably 95 percent of our ground is covered with grass so here's another seed um grain millet um here's some more grains just to, uh buckwheat um <clears throat> this isn't a grain this is uh, more of a herb but here's oats as well there's another wheat i don't know if i've come across it or maybe that was on back order i'll have to check that uh reseed again here's another ground cover um it's a flower but it, it's also a ground cover chickens really love clover i'm gonna have to get some white clover that's something i'm gonna have to add there's a couple things as, as I've gone through. Just as a little note, I ordered these and it was probably only four or five days ago. It was, I want to say it was Friday of last week and I got them Tuesday of the following week. So um, Baker Creek does get your seeds out to you fairly quickly. I was very surprised how quick it came in. So there's some crimson clover. Um, we went to a farm. Um, I'm not sure if we'll make a video on it. My wife did post an Instagram on a farm. I actually have some honey from them. The Heinz East Fork Farm, which is in Edmond, Kentucky. It's not very far from us. They had a uh, Kentucky Maple Syrup Day, the first ever. And um, they gave us a tour of the property. The reason that I brought them up and uh, the little mind poke was from this clover. They do a lot of bees, which is where that honey came from. They do a lot of bees, but they use white clover. So that is, you know, as you gain information, you learn, you go on. So I need to add some white clover as well. Some people may be thinking, why are you planting nettle? Are you crazy? I actually got two types of nettle. Stinging nettle. Let's plant a plant that stings your legs when you walk by. I actually, my first experience with this was in a garden over in Tucson. It was a community garden. And I was talking to the guy that ran the garden, the garden manager. And I said, what is this plant right here? I was walking around in shorts. I said, every time I hit my legs on it, it uh, feels like some bug is biting me. And then it had a residual effect. You know, it has this stinging effect to it. But this is supposed to be a very useful herbal plant. And I keep coming across it. I'm going to plant it very cautiously and um, make sure I don't place it, you know, right outside my door where I'm going to rub my legs up against it in the summer. But um, this is the beginning of the herb section. So there's some stinging, some nettle. We got some dill, you know, dill pickles. Um, this is a flavoring herb, basil. This is also an Italian variety of, of basil. Basil is used a lot in Italian foods. Many of you know this already. Basil is a good go-to. Uh, here's a little tip for basil. We used to do, we used to grab a bunch of it, maybe like 10 or 15 leaves, and then just grind it up in our hand and rub it on our exposed skin during the summer and it would repel mosquitoes, literally. I could see a mosquito come in and it would, like there was a force field, it would, it would hit, as soon as it would get that aroma, whatever it was that's repelling it, it would go there and it would just stop and then it would take off. It was pretty amazing. So I know firsthand that this is a good mosquito repellent as well as, you know, use in flavoring foods. You're welcome. Lemongrass. I've never grown lemongrass. I keep seeing it and uh, people are using this in uh, smoothies and such. I got to do a little bit more research, but this is something that I keep coming across. Cilantro. Man, if there isn't an herb that gets used around our house more. Um, many of you know my wife's of Hispanic descent and uh, she makes some really good Mexican food. And um, cilantro is a Mexican food staple. Many Mexican dishes have that. We just made some uh, guacamole, avocado-based chip dip yesterday, and that cilantro sets it off. We use a lot of cilantro, so we will plant a lot of cilantro. A lot of people don't know that cilantro, the seeds of cilantro, 
are called coriander. So I actually have, and you can see in the um, in the name of it, scientific name, coriandrum sabatum. I believe sabatum is the salvia genus, but um, it is also the herb coriander which is used in pickling a lot. It has um, a lot of uses. So this is cilantro and coriander. So if you order cilantro and coriander separately, you don't have to. Here's a free seed, echinacea. This is, um, a lot of people use echinacea tea when they get sick. Um, it's also a flower. Thank you Baker Creek for the free seed. A lot of these free seeds are end up being things that I kind of was on the fence about and I was trying to keep my um, seed order fairly modest but these little additions are pretty neat so thank you for that rosemary um, we use this a lot in um, flavoring meats roast as well as thyme you'll see thyme here in a, in a second um, chamomile a flower and a herb a lot of these herbs will flower and bring um, beneficial insects into the garden as well as pollinators so they're kind of dual purpose and that's something that we look for in permaculture so there's some chamomile chives it's uh, in the onion family mild onion flavor perennial there's another perennial and it has those flowers i've grown chives before and i like to have chives around those are something you can go and clip and become very useful you may be able to hear the rain in the background which is why I'm inside doing a video right now and not digging a hole or poking around in the garden. Here's a little sneak peek, just something to mention. I'm working on a video about uh, different areas on the property and their fertility, some observations that I've come across and where I think certain seeds that I'm going over right now may do well. So a lot of these herbs do well in wet soils. Um, I've used a lot of these. I've planted catnip. A lot of the mints do very well in aquaponics and um, those wet locations will be prime um, prospects for stuff like catnip. Catnip is in the, um, the mint family. Some companies will also call this cat mint. They say this is really good for chickens um, intestinal tract, their guts. So we like to have some catnip as a um, natural immune booster to throw the chickens every once in a while it's also good for us we'll chew on a, a leaf or two here's a natural sweetener a stevia uh, we had this in our garden uh, last year it's pretty neat you can pick the plant i've never really used it um, in something a lot of times if you go to a restaurant you have sugar and you'll have sweet and low and you'll actually have a stevia based. I forget what it's called. I don't use it in the granulated form, but it's actually a plant, plant based. Um, mullen. This is, I would say, a cover crop, something that we'll use as a, a chop and drop. I've got to do a little bit more research on the mullen. I know that it has a very deep root system and is a very good mineral and nutrient miner. So a lot of times you'll see here that we're not just growing things for the produce. You know, we don't just get a tomato out of it. It actually has other uses as well. Here's thyme, um, and that'll kind of round off the herbs. I didn't intend on this video being so long, but um, it is what it is, as they say. Here's moringa. I'm not sure how well this will do here. Uh, we may have to baby this a little bit and put this in a greenhouse. Um, even in Tucson, Arizona, we had some issues. Yeah, it says right here, overwinter container plants in frost-free conditions. So I kind of knew that with having this before and growing this. Moringa is what's called a superfood, super high in calcium, phosphorus, manganese, all kinds of these um, really good for you nutrients. It's also a very good chop and drop plant you can slash and drop it and it, it takes the abuse so what happens is the roots of the plant just like I was talking about mullen they go down and they put all those nutrients in these leaves and you just chop the, um, the leaves off and drop them under other plant to feed them so it's basically you're growing your own fertilizer and that's part of the method of permaculture 
So there's a perennial, here's a, another perennial huckleberry. I'll leave out the, um, the reference to the uh, Western movie. Tombstone. Spinach strawberry. I thought this was pretty neat. I had never heard of this before. Supposedly, and I, I believe it, I'm not saying this supposedly to be um, skeptical, but the, um, the leaves are edible and the fruit is edible. So it's like spinach and strawberry. Spinach and strawberry. <laughs> And they call it strawberry spinach. An old fashioned plant that dates back to 1600 in Europe. Produces greens like spinach, also yields attractive berries that are nice in fruit salad. That is a score. And I'm very curious to see how that's gonna turn out. <clears throat> Here we have a uh, broccoli type. This is called the Romanesco. It's an Italian broccoli. Really cool looking stuff. Um, I actually have a friend in Tucson that turned me on to this. This is a shout out to you, Lale, if you end up watching this. Can't wait to see what happens with that. Here's another flower marigold. This is also, a, you know, this has many uses. It's a mosquito repellent flower beautifier, and it also is an herb. These do well in dry places. So this is one thing that I've learned about marigold is it's kind of an indicator plant. If you're not sure about it, plant it in that area. If it does well, it's usually an area that drains well and has relatively dry soil. I don't see that it has a note about that. This uh, marigold is also very easy to reseed. Once it dries out, <clears throat> the flowers don't look like that anymore. They kind of shrivel up. You just pull that flower head out and there's probably about 40 to 50 little seeds that are attached to the dried up flower petals. Um, very handy little flower to have. Okay, let's go into the melon squashes and um, cucumbers. So I think I got two varieties of watermelon. And these are both varieties that I hadn't grown before. I kind of picked these because these are varieties that have done well. And uh, this strawberry variety had really good reviews on it. Oh, another thing to mention is um, Baker Creek also has, you know, when you select the, um, say you're looking at this strawberry and you click on it, It'll have reviews of customers that have grown this. You can see where they've grown it, their region. A lot of times it's different parts of the world. You can see if it will do well in your area. And that's the reason that I chose these two. You can see if it's done well in your area and you can see the experience and the tips that those growers have had and are giving for that product, which is very helpful. Anytime you can have somebody's first-hand experience on something, it's way more helpful than going through and just reading generic information. So, you know, on some of these, you may read something like, you know, I planted these twice. I planted them in April and I planted them in March and I live in this area. And in March, all of the watermelon produced excellently. I mean, that kind of information is just golden. It's exactly what you want. And they have that on the Baker Creek website when you're looking through these. So here's some, um, Victoria really wanted to do um, pumpkins. I wasn't even planning on doing pumpkins, but we picked out two pumpkins. And uh, we'll see how those go. Of course, these are usually a later fall, you know. These come around Halloween. Um, so you plant these later in the season when it starts to cool off again. Um, a lot of times you'll read stuff too. I kind of mentioned, you know, plant these at this time and this and that. One thing that I've noticed is if you plant a little bit at a time and you keep doing what they call succession planting, like say, um, you know, you're looking at the almanac or, or whatever it may be. Um, here it says, you know, plant when the ideal temperature is 75 to 90. So this melon, I'm not going to plant right now. But what I can do as it starts getting closer to that, say it starts getting into the 60s, I can plant a few and see if they start germinating and coming up. And a lot of times they'll get a head start. They'll come up when it's cooler and they'll get established before it gets super hot. So what I'm saying is just because it says wait till it's 75 to 90, it doesn't mean that you have to do that. The more you experiment, the more variables and the more 
opportunities you give your plants to grow in different areas at different times of the year, the more possibility of success that you will have. A lot of times you'll see, especially in large scale farming, that they'll have a certain date that they're planting every year and they plant acres and acres of things and then what happens is a frost hits or uh, maybe it gets super warm or germination rate is low because it it doesn't rain quite as much as it normally does that time of year and the whole crop is hindered they have a hard time with that crop if you're planting in small group if you need you know, a quarter acre of lettuce because you're going to market. Yeah, then you kind of have to do that. But my point is, if you can plant things in small groups at different times, a lot of times you'll have success at least in one of those. So it gives you more possibilities for success. Here's uh, two cucumbers that I got. Actually, I got three cucumbers. Um, these two cucumbers are basically just cucumbers that you can pick and eat. These are smaller. This one's actually called a muncher. I like to have stuff in the garden that you can just directly pick, like the strawberries, tomatoes, peas, stuff like that that you can just eat right there. And these are one of those. Actually, the reason I picked this one, this is an Australian variety, unique heirloom from Australia, um, about the size of a lemon. But it had really good reviews when I read the customer reviews. It talked about how their, their kids, and it actually has a picture of a child here, how their kids would just pick them and eat them and they loved picking them. So I look for stuff like that on the reviews, stuff that the kids will really enjoy. It'll draw them out to the garden. So now we're um, talking about the squash. I got two types of squash, a um, zucchini black beauty. I've had very good success with this one as well as the golden zucchini very similar just kind of adds a different variety to it but um these are very productive if you have a family of five and you have two plants that are producing i would say you'd be it would be very hard for you to keep up with the production of these plants once they really get going we'll move on to the tomatoes roma tomato this is our go-to tomato a lot of the tomato use that we use is in like a salsa. We don't really do a lot of cut tomatoes for like, um, you know, hamburgers or sandwiches and stuff like that. But if we do, just to simplify and not have, you know, we've already got five varieties of tomatoes here. Um, a lot of times people will have what they call a beefsteak tomato or a large tomato. And uh, both the Roma tomato and this Amish paste tomato tomato are more of a sauce tomato. I've never grown the Amish paste. I was talking to a gardener last week who has an apple orchard across the street and he grows these Amish paste tomatoes which is why I chose these. He says they do really well here and they use these and cut these up like a sliced tomato. So we'll have to see how those go. I have two different types of cherry tomatoes. There's the jujube I actually don't like a raw tomato a lot, but I do like cherry tomatoes. That kind of sounds weird. The cherry tomatoes don't seem to be as squishy. I think a lot of it for me is the texture. I like salsas and, you know, tomato paste as far as pizzas or pastas or whatever it may be. But for some reason, I couldn't just bite into this type of a tomato. It'd have just too much flesh and, and too much liquid inside of there. But these are uh, the more solid. They're less squishy. Here's also another cherry tomato that it's a yellow tomato. And I just like the cucumbers, I was reading about how a number of the kids like these. My kids really like tomatoes. They're not like me. They will eat a aroma tomato right off the vine and, and dig into it. Uh, one little tip that I've learned, if you like your salsas less runny, if you want them more consistent, a thicker consistency, you can add and use larger amount of these cherry tomatoes. They also kind of are sweeter and they kind of change it up. So just a little tip, try some cherry tomatoes in your salsa and let me know how that works out for you. I've had some really good success with that. I first tried that 
when um, there was a shortage of Roma tomatoes in the grocery store and there was a packet of these cherry tomatoes so I substituted those and uh, I was surprised it was really good so let's move on to the last category and that is the peppers um, I like peppers I like spicy things not crazy hot um, the same gentleman that I was telling you about that has the apple orchard gave me some Carolina Reapers that are guaranteed to hurt me I don't really like them that hot I like the taste that uh, pepper will give you this is actually a pepper that I grew in Arizona and had really good luck with this is a perennial it's a bush that will grow year after year I'm not sure how well it'll do here. It says even on here that this is, um, it does very well and is from the American Southwest. So we may have to grow this in a greenhouse or it may be something that just comes up in the summer. But uh, this is one of my favorite tasting peppers. You know, a lot of people will have different preferences on a lot of different things. Um, this is my favorite pepper. I like to take this dried out and um, crush it and add it to a lot of the um, vinegar based hot sauces like the Louisiana type hot sauces we have a hot sauce that I like to add it to that's called Tapatio I just crush that up and man that really adds some Shazam to it so uh, had to get that one this is the uh, Ozark Giant a living traditions their channel is an awesome channel they're in Missouri I believe Missouri or Arkansas which is where the Ozarks are and they have a great deal of success with these Ozark Giant this is just a bell pepper not a hot pepper a sweet pepper this is also a sweet pepper it looks kinda like a large pepperoncini. Um, I've never grown this it's called a Cubanelle and we'll see how that does this is the closest thing I could find to a uh, green chili um, the Gomez family got us hooked on green chilies they go down to Hatch New Mexico and pick up 50 100 pounds of green chilies at a time and freeze them so they have them over the year um, this says uh, right here a hearty vigorous introduction from the chili pepper breeding project in New Mexico State University so I'm not sure how well this will do I hope it does well but we're looking for something that we can grow to substitute those um, hatch green chilies that we got hooked on so if you've stayed to the end of this video I'm surprised but um, I will offer you 200 unredeemable point and say to you at this point, I'm thanking you for sticking around this point to the very end. Um, get your free catalog. Um, let us know and share with us what you plan on growing. I really want to encourage you, you know, uh, maybe one of the seeds that you found in this video that, that I pointed out you'd like to try. If you're not growing something, pick out a seed, you know. Stop at your Walmart when you pass by that seed collection, even if it is a hybrid seed or if you're at Home Depot and you see the seed packets this spring. Try something out. That's where I started out. Curiosity and just wanting to be able to grow my own plants from seeds. Seeds really are neat. It is a very um, fascinating thing that you can have this life trapped in a seed you know until that point that it comes back alive it's almost like a little magical capsule if you take this magic pill and put it in the ground eventually you're gonna get this fruit one day and so um, I hope you're encouraged I hope you have a desire to grow something let us know what you decide to grow and uh, grow on growers till next time we'll see you later the honey disappeared Ha, ha, ha.